Well, good morning. Howdy and welcome to the Symposia Chronic Thromobolic Pulmonary Hypertension. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Bear Healthcare Pharmaceuticals for the educational grant to support this program. Uh, my name is Victor Test. I am the program chair. Uh, from the, I'm from the University of Oklahoma, where I'm the chief of pulmonary medicine and critical care. Prior to that, I was at the University of California at San Diego. As part of this program, you're going to be at, uh, asking you to utilize the audience response system. You'll see in the middle of each table uh, a, uh, so, several little uh, keypads. Please uh, grab those and answer whenever we have questions for you. Um, at the in, end of each session, we will we'll conclude with a uh, question and answer period. If you have any questions for the speakers, just fill out the white cards that are sitting there in the middle of the table as well and pass those on, and then the ushers will bring them up here. In addition, uh, there's an evaluation form which we'd really like for you to fill out. Um, the answer should be that we were excellent. If, it's, if, you have any, if you have any question about those and you want, want me to guide you, just come up after the session. I'll be happy to point you in the right direction. Um, and then, of course, you are eligible for CME credit for this, uh, the directions at the end of your syllabus. Now, we're going to, uh, uh, in a moment, we're going to proceed to uh, the, uh, some information just for the CME people for demographics, which will involve the practice use of your keypads. But before I do that, I want to go ahead and uh, give you the background of my co-faculty uh, member, Dr. Uh, Hossein A. Gofrani from Giesen. And he is a professor of internal medicine there and chief of pulmonary vascular research. Uh, Dr. Gofrani has just a uh, very admirable uh, CV with an extensive research and clinical background and uh, a, is just a, a, has a wealth of experience in pulmonary vascular disease and it's a real pleasure to be on a, on a program with someone of such, uh, such stature. But we're going to go ahead and proceed with the, the demographic portion of our, uh, our morning. If y'all could go ahead and activate your act, uh, audience response and we'll try to move through that and get, and get to the heart of the program. All right, so the first question is, are you a ACCP member? Okay, so we're going to go to their next question. Uh, if you could go ahead and answer uh, as to your age range, please. You know, this is a, you're, you're kind of on the honor system with answering these questions, so you don't really need to put any you know, fudge on your age up or down. Just, I have to admit, I never expected to get such a good response out of an age-related question. Okay, very good. What is your gender? Okay. There you are. All right. Next. Okay, boy, this is, this is more complicated. What is your specialty? Suddenly the laughter left the room. Bless you. Okay. All right, which uh, category best describes your practice? Could you then describe your number of years in practice, please? 
do you uh, influence equipment purchase at your institution? Okay, now we're going to uh, start to get to the heart of the matter, and we're going to start with our pretest on the pathophysiology of chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. First question. Which of the following medical conditions is associated with the development of chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension? A, rheumatoid arthritis. B, peripheral arterial sclerosis. C, splenectomy. D, atherosclerotic coronary artery disease. And E, vitamin B12 deficiency. Okay, we're, just so you know, we're going to ask the same questions in post-test, uh, so I won't give you the answer directly now, but they will be directly answered during the uh, upcoming uh, lecture. Question number two, which of the following blood disorders is associated with the development of chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension? A, polycythemia vera, B, essential thrombocytosis, C, heterozygous factor V Leiden mutation, D, lupus anticoagulant, and E, antithrombin-3 deficiency. Okay, then uh, we're going to proceed then to uh, phase one of our expedition today uh, with pathophysiology of chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, in which I will be your host. Uh, this is, uh, we receive educational support by the American College of Chest Physicians and Bayer Healthcare Pharmaceuticals. Uh, as I said, I'm Victor Test. I'm the Chief of uh, Pulmonary and Critical Care at the University of Oklahoma uh, School of Community Medicine in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Before that, I was as part of the Pulmonary Vascular Group at the University of California at San Diego. I have uh, no disclosures uh, for this discussion today. You're going, as learning objectives, you're going to describe the pathophysiology of chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. And by the end of this lecture, you should be facile with this uh, rather simple description of the coagulation cascade. No, no, we're not going to try to do that today. I couldn't do that if I wanted to. Uh, I, would, I have to also put a little disclaimer out here. Um, Dr. Tim Morris was originally asked to give the pathophysiology lecture. I've, I've done this myself several times, but uh, I, he was kind enough to loan me several of his slides, particularly regarding uh, fibrinogen and so forth, and he, need, he deserves credit for that as we get started today. Now, pulmonary embolism, as you know, is a relatively common disease. Uh, there is a substantial percentage of patients who have recurrence after, uh, after an initial episode of venous thromboembolism, and you can see here uh, about 3% over a 10 to 12 year period. In Dr. Pingo's study uh, from Italy uh, a number of years ago, uh, they found that uh, about a three and a half percent of patients with an identified acute uh, pulmonary embolus ultimately developed chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. And of those that, that they identified, two of them had evidence of recurrent PE. In the United States, though, our percentages have seemed to be a good bit smaller. Uh, in this uh, study, looking at, in California at uh, hospital discharges uh, through uh, a registry in California, you can see that the incidence of chronic thromboembolism is really very, very small, about 0.5 percent. Uh, of all patients with PE, you see that 97 percent survived their initial hospitalization and uh, only about less than 1% developed ultimately chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. Why that difference between here and Italy, no one can really describe at this point. Now, whenever you have people with PE, you have to weigh, you know, duration of therapy versus mortality and risk of bleeding and the risk of recurrence. And 
you also have to wor uh, wonder about is if we did something different at the initial time of diagnosis, in other words, if we put them on, if we did thrombolysis, would it make a difference in the long run in preventing chronic thromboembolism? And that question is not clear at all from the literature. This is from the UPET trial in 1970 with the direct installation of urokinase into the pulmonary artery. The blue line is heparin. The green line is urokinase. And you can see that in the first day, there's significant in, uh, improvement in resolution. But by day five, the, the, the curves start to overlap. And the question we have to ask when we look at this sort of slide is, was that difference enough to save the patient? And clearly, if the patient presented with shock, we believe it probably is. Uh, however, in a hemodynamically stable patient, uh, that question is still trying to be answered. Now, every patient you see will have different uh, varying degrees of resolution of their uh, PE. And up here we see an example of somebody who had a 34% defect and six months later had no defect on a, on a perfusion scan. Uh, similarly, this patient had 62% defect and then at the uh, six-month period had an 18% defect. This patient here started off with 43% of a defect and had a 40% at the end, which raises the question of how acute was his clot to start with and did he actually present initially with a acute on chronic event rather than an, a purely acute pulmonary embolism. Now, as part of that UPET trial in 1970, they looked at the amount of recovery uh, and followed patients out for up over three months. And you can see uh, that the percentage of, rec uh, of recovery in those first three months got up around 35% on average. But in this series of studies that we have here, you can see that ultimately in the UPET trial, they, uh, if a follow-up at one year, there was uh, almost 80% uh, resolution by ventilation perfusion lung scan, and you can see varying amounts throughout there. But the reality is that almost everyone after a PE will have some residual if you use a ventilation perfusion lung scan. This is, uh, again, a, a, another uh, looking at a series of different studies and looking at the time uh, and uh, time course of initial improvement in perfusion defects. And you can see that in the first few days, there's a pretty dramatic improvement, but then it levels off over time with almost everybody presenting with some degree of obstruction by ventilation perfusion lung scan. Conversely, if you look at CT angiography in this study that was published just a few years ago by Dr. Stein, who is a, a legend in the world of venous thromboembolism, you can see that uh, at about 28 days we have a very high percentage, 80% of patients with, um, with essentially complete resolution by CT scan. Now I'm going to address that a little bit further, why there's a difference between VQ scan and CT scan in the next lecture, but it's something to keep in mind. This is a, 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 almost a painfully busy slide, but the real point here is to show that by echocardiography, you can see uh, a, a, almost the same sort of time course in terms of the pulmonary artery pressure. You see initial pressures, which are in some cases quite high. You see a rapid decline, and then they sort of level off somewhere in the first 30 to 50 days. So the question we have to answer as part of this discussion is, when does this acute clot become this chronic clot, which is more like a scar? And one of the misconceptions in, uh, is that this chronic clot is like a big red clot that uh, is just formed there. Usually what happens over time is the, this red clot is incorporated in the arterial wall, so it becomes a, a more permanent scar. And it goes from and creates these obstructions, which we see here and here, and then ultimately leaves us with this endarterectomized specimen where we have chronic scarring, which obstructs the pulmonary vascular bed. So, how do we connect those clots? Well, in the world of chronic thromboembolism, Dr. Bonderman in 2009 did a very, uh, thir uh, very, uh, 
thorough uh, examination of the factors that are result in chronic thromboembolism. And uh, the things that are associated with it, you can see that ventriculoatrial shunts uh, in pacemakers have a relative, carry a relatively high uh, odds ratio, relative risk, as does splenectomy. Previous venous thromboembolism actually compar in comparison was relatively small. And you say, well, how can that be? And the answer is that fewer than 50% of patients who present with, for surgical evaluation for chronic thromboembolism have a history of, pre of known venous thromboembolic event. Recurrent venous thromboembolism is a little bit higher, non-O blood group type, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, thyroid replacement malignancy, all carry a significant risk for the development of chronic thromboembolism. Now, in terms of laboratory factors that we can measure or of identifiable hypercoagulable states, these are the ones that are most commonly seen, and lupus anticoagulant is the big cash cow there, followed by elevated factor 8. The non-O blood group type, lipoprotein A, and heart type fatty acid binding protein uh, abnormalities are relatively less common. And so, for example, the factor 5 Leiden uh, uh, mutation, which is relatively common, uh, or the most common inheritable uh, for, uh, hypercoagulable state, isn't really seen in an increased percentage in those patients who don't resolve their clot. And so this is a picture of an acute clot, and I think you can appreciate that the, in the arterial wall here there are, there's just a, a, a big mass of red uh, proteinaceous material, and you don't see a lot of cellular activity there. Over time, though, you start to see infiltration of lymphocytes, and you see it there, and ultimately then fibroblast, which we are starting to see here, which is the body's attempt to incorporate this acute clot into the wall of the vessel since it can't accurate, adequately dissolve it. So what influences that recovery? Well, I've, I've covered several of these points already, but an idiopathic etiology of PE is, is one thing. Patients who at the time of their PE have evidence of right heart strain are at significant, are at the highest risk uh, among patients with idiopathic PE for developing chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, and thus they really should be followed more closely. When you, as you, you have high, uh, higher risk with age, previous splenectomy we've already discussed, as we have ventriculoatrial shunts and uh, pacemakers, and then the chronic inflammatory disorders, particularly inflammatory bowel disease and osteomyelitis, are associated with the. Uh, um, the development of chronic thromboembolism. We've already covered this slide, so I'm going to move past it. One of the other things that have been identified is that, you know, for one, part of the process here is this clot sits there, and the body would normally dissolve it very efficiently. And we believe that only 0.5 to 3 percent of patients ultimately develop chronic thromboembolism from an identifiable event. So that the there must be something wrong with the ability of the body to dissolve this clot. And actually, there have been a number of researchers who have demonstrated that fibrinogen and its cross-linking can be very abnormal. This is my, uh, my friend Tim and his research lab, and they really are a smart research lab. I can't really lump myself in with them, but I can look puzzled, so I have that going for me. And Tim in his lab is one, of the, one, is one of the most active people in trying to, decide, to describe why these patients can't resolve their clot. And so he has identified several mutations in the fibrinogen molecule where the fibrin is very resistant to fibrinolysis. And you'll see here that these are the different mutations. Uh, and what happens is they get a net, net negative charge because of the sialic acid that's on their uh, on their fibrinogen, and it, and it just absolutely resists fibrinogenolysis. Fibrinogen, fibrinogen there we go. And, the, and so these are just a few. There's actually several more that have been, a, a fili, uh, have been determined. And now, the, now, then once that fibrin stays there, when it sits there, it actually activates cytokines that cause inflammation and smooth muscle proliferation, and ultimately myocyte activation and then fibroblast proliferation, and there's increased uh, VEGF secretion, 
and platelet-derived growth factor, all of which stimulate the, bo the body's attempt to incorporate this clot that can't be dissolved into the arterial wall and results in the obstruction that we see. So in the, to connect the dots, we have resistance to fibrinolysis, persistence of the ligands between the fibrinogen strands. That results in an abnormal clot structure, which stimulates uh, uh, cell, uh, cell activity, and particularly fibro, uh, fibroblast migration and myocyte activity. And then the body remodels that into the scar that we see right here. So the key messages on this, on this part of the discussion are chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension is a rare but curable form of the disease. It, it, chronic ventricular atrial shunt, thyroid replacement, splenectomy, and malignancy are medical conditions associated with it. Its most common clotting abnormality is the lupus anticoagulant, followed by the elevated factor eight. And they often have resistant, uh, fibrinogen resistant to fibrinolysis, resulting in the chronic scar. So now we're going to do our post-test. And the question number one, which you've seen before, is which of the following medical conditions is associated with the development of chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension? A, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. B, peripheral arterial sclerosis. C, splenectomy. D, atherosclerotic coronary artery disease. And E, vitamin B12. All right, and I, I'm gratified that 88% uh, of you got the answer correct because it is the answer there is splenectomy. So pat yourself on the back. And we showed a substantial improvement from the uh, pretest. So, again, thanks for listening. I'm beaming right now inside. I'm so, I'm so very happy. Now, please, you know, hopefully that will continue. Which of the following disorders is associated with the development of chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension? A, polycythemia vera, B, central thrombocytosis, C, heterozygous factor V Leiden mutation, D, lupus anticoagulant, and E, antithrombin-3 deficiency. Wow, you're, this is, you're a good group. I appreciate it. So 95%. That's excellent. And again, showing a rather dramatic improvement. Good job. Okay. So now we, uh, we have yet another pretest as we head into the second lecture, which is also going to be given by me, um, the Diagnostic Evaluation of Chronic Thromboembolism. In this case, a 38-year-old woman presents with progressive dyspnea and right heart failure. Her echocardiogram suggests pulmonary hypertension. Which is the best screening test for chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension? A, a chest radiograph. B, CT angiography. C, MR angiography. D, ventilation perfusion lung scanning. And E, pulmonary angiography. Alrighty, well, we're going to proceed to the next question, question number two. The patient has a ventilation perfusion lung scan with one unmatched perfusion defect. Based on this finding, you decide to A, refer the patient to a center that specializes in chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, B, start the patient on oral anticoagulants in therapy for pulmonary hypertension, C, ignore the finding since it does not meet PyoPed 1 criteria for a high probability VQ scan, or D, obtain a CT scan to rule out chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. Okay, very good. So uh, the last question we have in the pretest phase here. Uh, which of the following is a physical examination finding that is highly suggestive of chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension? A, a right ventricular heave. B, a pulmonic insufficiency murmur. 
C, a pulmonary artery brewery heard posteriorly, and D, pulmonary artery pulsation. All right, well, we're going to proceed to the uh, next lecture, which is also, like I said, I'm also uh, honored to give, and it's on diagnostic evaluation. Uh, before, and as we get ready to start, we need to again acknowledge the American College of Chest Physicians and Bayer uh, Healthcare Pharmaceuticals for their educational grant. Uh, once again, I have no uh, uh, faculty, uh, uh, noth nothing to disclose uh, for, to you for this lecture. Uh, at the, uh, we're going to delineate the process and procedures to be used in obtaining an appropriate diagnosis of chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. And, you know, and before we launch into the slides, I, when you talk or when you speak frequently on things that are really important to you, it's always important for me to remember that, you know, while I see this disease with some regularity, many of you may have never seen a case or you don't anticipate that you'll ever see one. And I, I left UCSD about a year and a half ago to go move to Oklahoma. And about three or four months after I moved there, I was consulted about, uh, a, on a patient who is a, for, an, a uh, licensed vocational nurse who had been disabled for about two years. Uh, two years before, she had had a diagnosis of acute PE with a large uh, a, uh, thrombus in her right main pulmonary artery, uh, pulmonary artery and then several segmental uh, PEs on the left. At that time, she was significantly impaired, and after being started on anticoagulation, she never got better. She had, over the next year and a half before I met her, a series of admissions for, quote, recurrent PE. And as we look back at those scans, they were one CT scan after another. They, it was pretty clear all along that this patient had had the same PE on each visit. Um, they, and when I was consulted, it was for a recurrent PE. At that time, she had an estimated RV systolic pressure in the 90s, massive RV dilatation. She, her weight, because of fluid retention, was up almost 75 pounds. She was in a functional class 4 state and had been that way for about six months when she had a syncopal episode and came back in the hospital and was once again diagnosed with acute PE. Uh, when we looked at the scan, she had no perfusion to the right, uh, or VQ scan had no perfusion at all to the right middle lobe, right lower lobe. She had just faint perfusion to the right upper lobe, multiple perfusion abnormalities on the left, a cardiac catheterization. She, in fact, had extensive or uh, severe pulmonary hypertension with marked impairment of the cardiac output with a cardiac index of 1.2 and a mixed venous sat of 45%. We, uh, I sent her off to my former colleagues in San Diego where she underwent a uh, pulmonary thrombin arterectomy and came back uh, almost 100 pounds smaller and with functional class one uh, exercise capacity just, uh, just three weeks after surgery. And I'm now a year and a half later, I've been seeing her since that time, and uh, she's still you know, completely asymptomatic with a normal echo. And in this, if you take the reason it's so important that we diagnose these people are patients like this one who had numerous opportunities for the disease to be recognized, but no one put the progressive deb debility and disability with a clot that wasn't resolving. And I, I really think that no one had actually ever looked at the series of scans in conjunction with each other because they showed the same clot over and over and over again, which would have been a clue of unresolving thromboembolism rather than a recurrent PE. In any event, chronic thromboembolic disease is a variable in, for, in, in, in frequency. We think it's still quite rare with uh, you know, up to 5% being reported in some series and less than 0.1% in other series of acute PE survivors. There's no apparent age or gender bias. Uh, just so you know, at uh, UCSD when I was there, the youngest patient that we took care of at, at the adult hospital was 12, uh, and the oldest that we took care of with acute PE was uh, 90 years old in the time I was there with, pardon me, with chronic thromboembolism. Uh, 
there's a, often a delay uh, between symptom onset and diagnosis, which of course is a common theme in the world of pulmonary hypertension. Uh, on our, uh, since with the original NIH trial, it was about 2.5 years, and we, in the recent reveal registry here in the United States, it was uh, a little bit, actually a little bit uh, longer than that before the onset of symptoms than the diagnosis was made. Uh, like I said, unfortunately, most of our patients never have a history of DVT or PE, but if you ever meet someone with pulmonary hypertension who has that history, that alarm bell should start ringing that they potentially have a curable disease. Uh, and one of the reasons that we see this delay is because alternative diagnoses are frequently entertained. And the, you know, the patient I was telling you about um, actually had been diagnosed with COPD, despite the fact that she had never smoked in her life. And I think in the, in the United States, it's really quite common for patients above the age of 50 who come in with recurrent episodes of dyspnea to be labeled as having COPD because it is a quite, quite a common disease. In younger patients, the most common thing that is diagnosed is asthma, which is, again, far more common. And, you know, in most of these patients, as I discussed earlier, we really can't define a true prothrombotic tendency except for the lupus anticoagulant, which occurs with a little more frequency. Um, now, risk factors at the time of acute PE, which we've already discussed in part, are previous PE. If you're younger, you're more likely to end up with uh, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. If you have a larger perfusion defect, if the PE was idiopathic at presentation. Um, and also, I might add, if you had a significant RV strain, which is something I should have put on, back on this slide, even though it wasn't part of the original study by Dr. Pengo. Medical risk factors we've already discussed with splenectomy carrying an odds ratio of 13, chronic inflammatory disorders with an odds ratio of 67, and ventricular atrial shunt being a very uh, high risk factor for the development of chronic clot. And as we talked about, alternative diagnoses are very often uh, considered, particularly uh, idiopathic pulmonary hypertension, uh, in, in the older population, ischemic heart disease, uh, obstructive or interstitial lung disease. Uh, patients are often labeled as having psychogenic dyspnea and deconditioning or obesity. And sometimes all those things, some of those, sometimes we see patients with all those things, but they still have chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. In terms of symptoms, the symptoms are identical to that that we see in patients with idiopathic PAH with exertional dyspnea being far and away the most common symptom. Dyspnea at rest is actually quite rare because it, and it usually is the manifestation of end-stage heart failure. Uh, fatigue uh, is common in these folks. Interestingly enough, in the reveal registry and in uh, the NIH registry before that, if you looked, it was only about 30 percent of patients in, that, in the registries complained of fatigue. And I bet if I polled any one of y'all, uh, polled the audience right now, in fact, I might just do that, how many of y'all are fatigued? Because, you know, you know, I, I would bet that on any given day I could come up with about 50 percent of doctors who are fatigued, but interestingly enough, in pulmonary hypertension patients, they don't complain of fatigue that much. Uh, Nonproductive cough and occasionally hemoptysis. Uh, chest pain. Chest pain is a particularly concerning uh, symptom because that represents uh, right ventricular ischemia usually, and those patients are at risk for death. Um, of course, they develop right heart failure in all of its manifestations. Uh, Presyncope and syncope, with syncope carrying a, a very uh, ominous uh, sign. And then uh, hoarseness, which is known as Ortner's syndrome, uh, where the uh, left pulmonary artery uh, stretches the recurrent laryngeal nerve and you get uh, left uh, vocal cord paralysis. Uh, in my uh, career as a pulmonary vascular doctor, I've seen that twice, so it's a relatively rare manifestation. As for physical examination, they have the normal things you would expect. We would expect these patients to have clear lungs because they have precapillary pulmonary hypertension. In fact, they have large vessel obstructive pulmonary hypertension. Um, they typically have, uh, if, you can hear, if you can hear them listening in a quiet enough environment, an accentuated P2. They frequently have splitting of the second heart tone and an RV lift, which is typically the point of maximal impulse being shifted medially and often inferiorly. And jugular venous distension is often present now. Edema and ascites, hepatomegaly can be seen. And you'll find people with severe jugular venous distension who have very little edema and little ascites. And you'll see patients with lots of ascites who have relatively little jugular venous distension. I really can't make a, a heads or tails of why that occurs the way it does. But the one thing that I get really excited about in my clinic, and 
when I, and I listen for it in every patient who's referred to me, is a pulmonary artery bruit or a flow murmur, which was typically heard in the infrascapular region uh, at mid-inspiration. So you have to pretty well listen for it, and you'll hear a flow murmur there. And when you hear that, it is almost pathognomonic for large vessel obstruction. And it's a really good sign in terms of finding patients who are surgically uh, or amenable to surgical intervention. Now, it isn't truly a pure chronic thromboembolic finding because you can see it in pulmonary artery sarcoma, and you can hear it, see it in large, ve uh, uh, large vessel vasculitis. You can even see it occasionally in fibrosing mediastinitis. But the odds are that it's going to be chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension when you hear that. And so that's a really encouraging sign. Now, as for the diagnostic evaluation, I mean, the most important thing is suspicion. And if you suspect the disease, then you're far more likely to find it. And most of our patients end up going through virtually all of these tests, uh, chest radiograph, EKG, pulmonary function studies, echo, VQ scan, and then right heart cath with or without pulmonary angiography. Pulmonary function testing, uh, and this study was actually published by my friend Tim Morris, uh, looking at spirometry, uh, can range from normal, but almost everybody has some abnormality. They may have mild obstruction, mild restriction, uh, about 20% are restricted. The diffusing capacity is usually mildly to moderately reduced. It can be occasionally normal. But if you see severe reduction in the DLCO, then you probably need to look further for intrinsic lung disease or be suspicious of the disorder called pulmonary venoocclusive disease. In terms of oxygenation, they can be perfectly normal at rest. They virtually always desaturate with exertion. Uh, and if you put them on a uh, maximal cardiopulmonary exercise bicycle or a treadmill, you'll find that their VD uh, dead space to tidal volume ratio is increased. Now, the VQ scan is still critical to us in distinguishing large and small vessel pulmonary hypertension. Um, in chronic thromboembolism, they may have multiple segmental defects, but they really only have to have one. One unmatched, unmatched segmental defect is, is enough to give you a suspicion for chronic thromboembolism. Uh, in small vessel disease, they typically have a moth-eaten or pat, patchy appearance. And on your right, you'll see a classic moth-eaten appearance as opposed to the left where we have a major low bar perfusion abnormality and a wedge-shaped abnormality on the periphery there. That would be a high probability scan by pyopaid criteria. Now, the uh, unmatched, you know, we, like I said, we only have to have one unmatched segmental or larger perfusion defect. It's very distinct from the modeling that I just showed you. And the VQ scan often underestimates the degree of obstruction. So you'd say, you might say to me, well, why is that, you know, why would you get that test then? And it's because in chronic thromboembolism, we're trying to cast a wide net. We want to have a test that will capture the overwhelming majority of people with chronic clot because it's a curable disease, a curable form of an otherwise lethal disorder. And so we, we do understand that the VQ scan may underestimate the degree of obstruction, and this is a really good example of that here, which is the VQ scan, you see, it doesn't look terrible, but when you look at that angiogram, you understand then that there's a lot, a very significant amount of chronic clot. When the reason it, it, it underestimates it is it's not, this clot is not completely obstructing all the blood flow, so small amounts of blood are still slipping through, and so on a perfusion scan, if you have just a few red blood cells that are labeled going through to an area, it looks like it's perfused. But in this case, uh, this is probably the most dramatic example I've ever seen of somebody whose v, uh, who's VQ scan underestimated his degree of obstruction. That was his surgical specimen, so you can see he had rather extensive disease. Now, many of you are probably in institutions where if you try to arrange for a VQ scan now, you, you, uh, you, it's as if you're trying to incite a rebellion against the government. Um, and I don't actually have that problem at my institution. My radiologists are very agreeable. But I, I think most people in the United States use CT scanning as their first stop 
for the diagnosis of acute PE. Now, I'm not going to get into whether I think that's right or not today, but that's what probably happens for most of us. And on CT, we can see eccentric or, or concentric lining thrombus. Uh, often the arteries are asymmetric in size, and so one artery will be much larger than another. They often have bronchial collaterals, and they can have mosaic perfusion. This is a patient I knew in Texas when I was uh, at Texas A&M. I actually knew this uh, man as a boy. I was, he owned a barbecue store in my hometown of Abilene, and I thought he was a giant then. And he came to see me, and he was just a tiny little man. Uh, but when I was a little kid, I thought he was a giant. Uh, and uh, he presented uh, two years after at acute PE uh, with uh, complete obstruction of his right main pulmonary artery. This is rather dramatic. If everybody had clot that looked like that, it would be quite easy to make diagnosis with CT scan. However, it's not always that easy, as you can see from these scans right here. And you can see some lining thrombus right there and some right there. Uh, but because when people read acute, uh, CT scans for acute P, they're really looking for intraluminal filling defects, not lining thrombus, and they're not looking for webs and pouches and the things that we normally see. And sometimes the findings can be as subtle on a CT scan as a vessel which just disappears in, from one cut to the next. And so it's a little, it, it is quite easy to miss a diagnosis of chronic thromboembolism. Now this is a, an example of the so-called mosaic perfusion. You see hyperemia right here and right here and right here and a paucity of blood flow to these other areas. Now that's very often mistaken for ground glass opacities of interstitial lung disease, but in the setting of someone with pulmonary hypertension, you'd have to be suspicious of chronic thromboembolism. Now, many of you probably say, well, the CT scan, that's easy to wrap my brain around. That's what my institution likes to do because it's easy to understand for acute PE. And unfortunately, the data to date it's still quite clear that CT scanning is not as good as VQ scanning in terms of sensitivity. Um, and specificity is not bad, but in the top study, which was published in 2007 using multi uh, detector CT, you can see that the CT sensitivity was only 50% with a specificity of 99%, whereas the VQ had a sensitivity of 96% and a specificity, which was really pretty good. Follow up study in 2012. Uh, had better sensitivities for CT scan, but you can see that VQ scan is still on top. Now, Dr. Soler uh, was one of my colleagues in San Diego, and we were doing an experimental study looking at um, spec scan, planar spec scanning and trying to estimate the number of segments that were involved, we're looking both at CT scan and VQ scan, and, and VQ scanning was more sensitive. Uh, we didn't have a specificity on that study, but uh, and, and we were strictly trying to determine if we were able to look, see better with uh, uh, spec scanning, and it was more sensitive, actually. Now, because of that and the fact that you're, you know, we're trying to find people with a potentially curable disease, VQ scan is still the preferred screening test for chronic thromboembolism. There, uh, it may eventually be re replaced, but at this point in time, it's still the best thing going for that. Now, all of our patients undergo cardiac catheterization, and we do that to quantify and confirm the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension. Sometimes we do exercise hemodynamics in patients who have borderline uh, pulmonary artery pressures. We do a saturation run to look for systemic left to right shunning. Uh, in patients who are scheduled to undergo, coronary, uh, undergo uh, pulmonary thromboendarterectomy, uh, if they're above the, if a man above the age of 40 and a woman above the age of 45, they almost always get coronary angiography. Um, at San Diego, our cardiologist did the pulmonary angiography for us and did the coronary, uh, the cardiac cath as well. Although uh, very often, pul pulmonologists still do their uh, cardiac uh, pulmonary uh, pulmonary angiograms and uh, right heart caths. In Tulsa, I have a, I have a radiologist that does the a very nice job. So again, we do coronary arteriography in men above the age of 40 and, uh, and women above the age of 45. If there's a family history or symptoms suggestive coronary artery disease, of course, we start sooner. There is a, uh, a entity of coronary artery obstruction by the pulmonary artery. It, imit it imitates a left main obstruction, uh, and it's not really an indication for bypass because if you fix the underlying uh, chronic thromboembolism, then the pulmonary artery will decrease in size and 
instruction will go away. At UCSD, we did angiography using an IJ approach with a 7 French or 8 French Berman catheter. Um, and we did unilateral sequential injections uh, with the tip near the lower lobe. And usually, very often, would start with a hand injection and then uh, use a, uh, an automated injector, depending on, the, on what we saw. Uh, and at UCSD, in a 25-year period, we had no deaths from pulmonary angiography, because many of you probably remember, even as recently as 10 or 15 years ago, uh, radiologists were sometimes uh, reluctant to do even BQ scans in patients because of some reports of death because of vascular obstruction. And But angiography certainly does carry a risk of death in these patients, and so it, it really shouldn't be done by an inexperienced uh, person. So wouldn't recommend it, and not in part because the the risk of death, but also because the interpretation of these is often sometimes somewhat tricky. This is an example of a pulmonary angiogram. I think most people could look at this and see that there are a lot of abnormalities here. There's, you know, we see uh, the thrombus and its accessibility on a, in an angiogram. You can see distinctive angiographic patterns such as a web, which we see right here. And you can see right here what we call post stenotic dilatation. You can see proximal occlusion right here. And we can see a pouch right there. This is a good example of a pouch. <laughs> I think everybody can appreciate that. And there's also some intimal irregularities right along here. Uh, this is another example of a pouch right here, and this is a band or a web. And I think most people, if you look at that angiogram, you could understand then, and you look at the pathologic specimens, why it is that medical therapy is not very successful in patients with chronic thromboembolism. Okay? It just, you can't dilate a vessel where there's no where there's no lumen. Uh, in this case, I don't, I don't see it very well from over here, but the vessel abruptly terminates. And then this, one of the advantages uh, we had at UCSD and I have in Tulsa is that I've convinced my angiographer to do lateral films. And if you look uh, up here at, at image A, you think, well, that's abnormal. There's clearly irregularities and, you know, probably a pouch right there, or a web right there, and there's not much blood flow out into the edges. But when you look at the lateral view, then you can see that there's no blood flow to the left lower, or no meaningful blood flow to the left lower lobe, or right lower lobe, rather. Now, one of the things that we did at UCSD, and which we virtually never do anymore, is something called pulmonary angioscopy. That is a, an extremely long pediatric bronchoscope. Uh, and we would take that and go through a, the, uh, we would sew a balloon onto the end. You had to, uh, you know, use your fly fishing skills to get the balloon on there to stay, and we'd inflate the balloon with CO2, go through a standard um, pulmonary artery, artery cortis or introducer, and with fluoroscopy and the cardiologist guidance, we would get out into the lung and lodge and the distal vessels. And this are, these are good examples of what we would sometimes see. And if you look here, you can understand a little bit why VQ scans might underestimate the obstruction, because uh, one or two red blood cells can get through there, but it's still akin to your thumb sitting over in the end of the water hose obstructing the blood flow. This being a relatively normal vessel at a bifurcation, but with these webs, which you see right there, and, the, and these complex looking obstructions. This is an example of what a VQ scan looked like on top preoperatively. Posterior scan, so this is the left lung, that would be the right lung right there. In the immediate post-operative period, you see the absence of the right upper lobe, and that is what we call steel phenomena because now there's blood flow to the right lung. And then in one month follow-up, then there's a dramatic improvement of blood flow to the entire right lung with re improvement to the left. So when we see these patients, we use at UCSD, we were using, we still use angi angiography. Uh, we do not use angioscopy with any kind of regularity anymore. Uh, CT criteria, uh, there are centers that use almost entirely CT, and I think eventually that will probably supplant uh, standard pulmonary angiography. And, at some t and there are times where you can see a CT and it clearly shows chronic clot, in which case we don't do a pulmonary angiogram. Um, I think the crucial thing in selecting your patients is, you know, for this is that you have experience with your surgeon and know what they can do. 
Uh, you also know, you know, having seen several of these, then you will, you know, you can help make a decision about whether the patient's really a candidate. In the meanwhile, you know, we've been trying to find different ways to improve our selection to make sure that somebody, no one goes through the operation uh, without um, getting a good result, which is actually, uh, fortunately, relatively rare that they, we have people with persistent pulmonary hypertension. But we can do something called partitioning of pulmonary vascular research, which has to do with uh, wedge decrement, uh, decrement decline in the wedge waveform uh, and looking at the slope of that. And we also do our pulmonary artery pulse pressures, and having a wide pulse pressure is usually a relatively good sign in terms of operability. Uh, one thing, though, is that when we look at our patients, um, preoperative, uh, preoperative uh, PVR is the best predictor of postoperative outcome uh, in terms of uh, success and also in uh, mort uh, perioperative mortality. Um, that being said, even patients with very high PVRs are maybe candidates for surgery. And if you, I would encourage you, when you see someone you think has this disease, even if you think it's a, sm a small likelihood, to refer them to a center so that they can evaluate the patient, because it does require a fair amount of experience to identify these patients sometimes. And to tie it up, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension is a rare but curable form of pulmonary hypertension. There's often a delay in the diagnosis. Patients uh, often have an, a, a rare, or often do not have an identifiable thromboembolic event, and the VQ scan is the best screening test for chronic thromboembolism. So we'll now proceed to the post-test question. A 38-year-old woman presents with progressive dyspnea and right heart failure. Her echo suggests uh, pH, which is the best screening test for chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension: A, a chest radiograph; a B, CT angiography. C, MR angiography, D, ventilation fusion lung scanning, E, pulmonary angiography. And then you'll notice that uh, walking around the room that, that if anybody has questions, you can write them down and then pass them off and get them. Excellent. 98% uh, got the answer correct. And I will tell you that uh, that is the stance of, uh, in all of our position papers about screening for, chron uh, for chronic thromboembolism. There are centers with expertise who use CT scan as their one-stop shopping, but uh, the, the um, guidelines strongly suggest that VQ scanning is still preferred. So good job. All right, so we'll go to question number two. The patient has a VQ scan with one unmatched perfusion defect. Based on this finding, you decide to A, refer the patient to a center that specializes in chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, B, start the patient on oral anticoagulants and therapy for pulmonary hypertension, C, ignore the finding since it does not meet the PIOPED criteria for a high probability VQ scan, and D, obtain a CT scan to rule out chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. All right, let's see how we did. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, you know, I think you, you certainly, uh, I think I, I'm gratified that you picked A. Um, I think, uh, you know, you can make an argument, certainly in this patient, for getting a CT scan to make sure there's no acute PE. Because as the VQ, as you know, the VQ scan can't tell you the acuity of the, of the problem. But, um, uh, you know, I think you could, you could certainly make that argument, but still, even if you did that, your next step would be to refer the patient to a center that specializes in chronic thromboembolism. So, actually, you know, A, it, it, the first one was the best choice, but I think uh, the E was a, good, was a reasonable choice as well. So, if you look at it that way, then we did really well again. So, good job. Question number three. Which of the following is a physical exam finding that is highly suggestive of chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension? A, a right ventricular heave. B, a pulmonic insufficiency murmur, C, a pulmonary artery brewery heard posteriorly, and D, a palpable pulmonary artery pulsation. Okay. All righty. So uh, we got uh, C, a 45, uh, is the, C is the correct answer, and 45% got that correct. Pulmonic insufficiency is heard regularly in all forms of pulmonary hypertension, as an arrival ventricular heave is very often felt. 
um, and a palpable pulmonary artery pulsation is occasionally felt. Uh, but in the, of a physical exam finding, the only one of those that truly suggests chronic thromboembolism is the pulmonary artery brewery, which is almost pathognomonic. So good, showed good improvement. Very good. So I, now we're going to transition, um, and I, we're going to go over the questions after uh, Professor Gafrani uh, does his uh, discussion on the treatment and therapy for chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. So if you could uh, welcome the professor. Uh, he's uh, it's quite a quite a pleasure to be on uh, on a panel with him because he has got such an uh, illustrious career. So. Good morning, everybody. Thanks, Victor, for perfectly preparing the stage for me. I think uh, now everyone became a CTEPH expert, so actually we can close here and leave, but uh, we have some work to do. Uh, and um, let's go through the uh, pretest questions first. And I think this is a quite um, simple question. Which of the following is approved for medical therapy of CTEF? Is it A, Iloprost? B, Bosentan, C, Sildenafil, D, Riosiguat, or E, none of the above. All right, so we will see the uh, correct answers later on. And now coming to a case history of a 65-year-old uh, male patient with CTF diagnosis about four years ago. Uh, the patient was on oral anticoagulation in functional class three. Uh, he had severely elevated pulmonary vascular resistance, equivalent to 12 wood units, uh, was successfully operated on. He had a PEA surgery, and we're going to see some of that later on. And the post-intervention hemodynamics showed reduced pulmonary vascular resistance, and that was a significant reduction coming from 12 to 3 wood units. And uh, as a consequence of it, three months after the intervention, the functional class was only one and two, or so uh, dramatically improved. So which of the following is consistent with a successful operation for this patient? A, lobar resection of an affected lung segment. B, removal of fresh clots from segmental and subsegmental pulmonary arteries. C, and end arterectomy, including organized thrombi, and membrane, membranous occlusions from segmental and subsegmental pulmonary arteries, D, removal of plexiform lesions, or E, none of the above. And I think after listening to Dr. Test's presentations, you are clearly aware which is the right answer. All right, so now we may proceed to the uh, presentation. Again, acknowledging the support. And here are my disclosures. And this is the learning objective, basically to update you on pharmacological and non-pharmacological treatments for this disease. And I'd like to also emphasize why at all in a mechanically obstructive disease such as CTEPH with a surgical treatment option with a curable uh, proportion of that disease, a med medical therapy may still have a place. So as we heard, we are now talking about chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, but we should be aware that some of these patients are misdiagnosed. In fact, in the uh, absence of uh, uh, a thorough workup, many patients are mistaken as having pulmonary arterial hypertension. And honestly, with the available medical uh, treatments, and there are uh, a multitude, there's a multitude of those, um, people are rather uh, willing to diagnose a, PEA, a PAH uh, than uh, to uh, go into the details of a CTEF diagnosis in the absence of easy to apply therapies. But nonetheless, we heard that CTEPH for some of the patients is the only curable form of pulmonary hypertension, while there is no single report of a cured PAH patients so far. So this has to be kept in mind and uh, increase our awareness that we should intensify our diagnostic uh, 
approach uh, so that we would be able to identify those patients properly and uh, refer them to a PEA center. Uh, many um, papers have been published on the uh, epidemiology and also the characteristics of patients with CTEPH and a recent uh, approach was uh, the uh, uh, um, initiation of an international prospective registry for CTEPH and first papers of this registry are out and I'd like to point your attention to those very valuable information you can derive from this very comprehensive multi-center prospective uh, study. And what you can find out here is that from all patients that were recruited, and be reminded, these centers that participated were all PEA centers. So, of course, there is a certain referral bias in, inherent to this uh, publication. But from those, from the 679, more than half of them were considered to be operable uh, primarily, and uh, less than half of them were considered non-operable. From those who were considered to be operable, again, uh, um, majority indeed underwent the, uh, uh, the surgical intervention, but still a sizable proportion of patients ultimately was not operated on. And interestingly, from those who were deemed inoperable in the beginning, still after careful evaluation, 13 patients were operated. So we have to reevaluate our decisions, and we may also see, and I think this is true both for San Diego and other higher volume centers, that with the increasing experience of the treating physician, of the surgeon mainly, um, decisions that have been made at the beginning of the learning curve of that respective uh, uh, surgeon may be uh, different from what the same surgeon would decide five years after, where the skills have improved and also the confidence towards the operation has changed, and that the same patient may be then uh, considered to be operable uh, who was previously by the same surgeon considered to be inoperable. These are practical issues we deal with daily when we treat these patients. So let me pinpoint on one single aspect that uh, also was referred to part, uh, uh, in part by Dr. Test, which is why at all does a presumably mechanically obstructive pulmonary disease has a progressive component? If we are able, with the help of anticoagulation, to prevent from new or recurrent pulmonary embolism. So why is that? And the explanation is quite simple. Let's assume we have a simple model of a pulmonary artery branch. And one part of the pulmonary artery is occluded by a clot, by a chronic clot that we saw in the beautiful presentations before. So what happens distal to this clot is that the vessel remains normal, thin-walled, and the vessel is, or is still perfused, and this, the perfusion is explained by a retrograde, a retrograde bronchial perfusion, and that's why I use the red color, because it's arterialized blood that you will find post the occlusion. But the progressive component of the disease happens, in fact, in the previously patent vessels, because here we have elevated pressures. We have progressive uh, uh, vascular uh, remodeling due to vascular wall stress. And this is in fact the, the part of the disease which, is, which pretty much resembles the progressive part of pulmonary arterial hypertension. And that may be also the treatment target for pharmacological therapies, provided the patient is not eligible for removal of this clot by means of pulmonary endotorectomy. If we remove the clots by means of this very elegant surgery, this vessel, the post-occlusional part of the vessel, is the one that gives way to the blood flow. And you saw the steel phenomenon that Dr. Test showed you in the scans pre and post-surgery. And the steel phenomenon is, is explained by the fact that the pulmonary vascular resistance in these parts is dramatically and acutely reduced, and it takes time until these previously patent vessels now remodel back to thin-walled normal pulmonary vasculature. So this is in part explaining the progressive part of the disease and how it regresses after you apply a curative surgery or gives uh, uh, an explanation why part of the disease at least may be targeted to medical therapies. But let's start first with the gold standard treatment for chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, with, which was and will be the surgical treatment. And this is one of the uh, pulmonary angiograms we frequently perform in a DSA technology. We take biplanar, uh, uh, depictions because our surgeon Eckhart Meyer in, in, in Bad Nauheim is 
uh, very fond of those uh, uh, pictures. And you may appreciate that this is, is, this is a, a type 1 uh, Jamieson classification of quite proximal occlusions of the pulmonary arteries. And then la lateral view, things become even clearer. Uh, most parts of the lower lobe are truncated from perfusion. The, uh, um, segment, the uh, segment 6 perfusion is also truncated at a quite uh, proximal level, and part of the upper lobe is also not perfused. And this is clearly subject to a surgical intervention. And the same uh, can be told about the uh, left side of the patient with almost no perfusion in the lower lobe. And the side view uh, shows you some of the features like uh, the uh, pouching and also uh, the webs and the post uh, uh, dilatation, the post occlusion dilatations that we sometimes see. So, as mentioned before, the uh, surgical intervention is uh, the um, gold standard treatment for those patients in case the obstructions are segmental or on a subsegmental levels of the pulmonary arteries. The uh, surgery has been invented by Stuart Jameson in San Diego, performed very successfully there. San Diego clearly is the holy grail of PEA surgery. Meanwhile, we may have up to 10 centers worldwide that perform more than 50 surgeries a year. Very few centers, maybe less than a handful, perform more than 100 surgeries a year. And clearly, uh, San Diego is still ahead. This is, uh, uh, by kind courtesy of uh, Eckhart Meyer, uh, movie showing you what Dr. Tess showed you before. This is not a wobbly, jelly-like, acute clot. This is really scar uh, scarous material. This is dense material that the surgeon removes under full uh, circulatory arrest and a deep hypothermia. Patients are cooled down to a core temperature below 20 uh, degrees of Celsius. And you can see that the uh, left main artery is opened and Eckhart is now developing uh, the specimen uh, to the periphery and trying to remove the clot. And you will see once he really gets out this little uh, piece uh, uh, of the uh, peripheral pulmonary artery, you may see a uh, flow of... Uh, very um, light red blood coming uh, post-occlusional, and this is the post-occlusional bronchial perfusion that you see. The bronchial perfusion, by the way, is also the reason why the uh, surgery has to be undertaken under full circulatory arrest. Otherwise, the operation field would be, would be continuously uh, filled with blood. And now he's removing it, and then you see light red blood coming. That's what the surgeon wants to see as a success measure of uh, successfully removing the clot. And then the clots may look like this, and you see uh, this is a part which the surgeon is not developing under sight. He doesn't see what he develops until to the periphery, but still can go into very distal subsegmental pulmonary arteries, removing those occlusions. These are uh, casts of the uh, pulmonary artery branches. This is another specimen derived here, and I think it's, it's obvious from first sight that this is no acute jelly-like clot. This is really... Uh, scar material that filled out those uh, vessels. And the success is also obvious. It is uh, uh, experienced by the patients, it's measurable, and we can even visualize the success of the surgery. This is a preoperative pulmonary MR angiogram showing you the occlusions of the vessels here on the right side and also in the left lower lobe. And here is also a truncation, and you see that the majority parts of the pulmonary circulation have been reopened and reperfused post-operatively, uh, not so well in the left pulmonary artery, but this may even improve over time. But this is a dramatic improvement. And you may also appreciate that the size of the central pulmonary artery that was massively dilated pre-surgery as a uh, reflection of the elevated pulmonary pressures and the distension of the pulmonary artery has now uh, shrunk again back to almost normal levels. Also, the cardiac function of these patients improves dramatically. I don't know whether we have moving images here or not. But even if not, if you look at the cardiac MRI here, the right atrium is massively di dilated before the surgery. The right ventricular cavum is massively dilated. We have right ventricular hypertrophy. And look at the left ventricle. Nothing is left to, f to be filled. There is a septal bowing, and that's the reason why the patients have a forward failure, a forward cardiac output failure, because the left ventricle is not filling appropriately. Uh, only two weeks after surgery, this has dramatically changed. Of course, you won't get rid of the right ventricular 
hypertrophy, muscle hypertrophy in only two weeks. This takes longer. But the right ventricle, this is the lesson we learned after transplantation or these kind of interventions where the pulmonary vasculature, uh, uh, vascular resistance is almost reduced to normal after it has been massively elevated before, is that the right ventricle opposite to the lef left ventricular myocardium can completely normalize. So we don't need a heart lung transplantation in patients with severe idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension. We only need a lung transplantation. Only in case there are selected uh, cardiac defects, for instance, we would do uh, both organs. And uh, we see in patients that after a year, you, do, you barely see any uh, morphological changes in the right ventricular myocardium uh, anymore. But most importantly for the patient, explanatory of the fact that these patients recompensate quite rapidly is that now blood passes through the lung adequately and fills the left atrium, fills the left ventricle, provides forward cardiac output, and that's why the patients improve. And, you know, we IPAH physicians, I would say, we are using the six-minute walking test as a measure of success of our, um, of our uh, uh, medical therapies. Uh, PA surgeons, they use the six hours mountain walking test, and this is a picture that um, uh, Eckhart got from one of his patients. After successful surgery, uh, the patient is a 65-year-old, uh, a 60-year-old man with his son walking off, uh, up the uh, Pitz Rosek uh, up to an altitude of 3,800 meters, and this is the six hours walk up there and not uh, the six-minute walking test. So this explains to you how dramatic this uh, surgery can change the life of the patients. But there is also some reason to further investigate on potential non-surgical therapies. To start with, we have to recognize that some of these patients have, from the beginning, quite distal obstructions of their, uh, of their pulmonary arteries. And this is very well described, uh, particularly for patients with AV shunts, for instance, or after spl splenectomy, they may have a quite distal distribution of their pulmonary uh, clotting and uh, the respective uh, parts of the uh, occlusions. Uh, as I said, uh, we also recognize that with the duration of the disease, there is a particular progressive uh, remodeling component of the disease in the pulmonary vessels, which uh, remains progressive. Even if you stop from further clotting, the patients will progress. I've never seen a CTEPH patient with established chronic thrombomolic pulmonary hypertension ever improving just upon setting up an oral anticoagulation treatment, these patients will ultimately deteriorate if they don't receive the appropriate treatment, which in the first place should be surgery. We also heard that preoperative pulmonary hemodynamics are decisive for the postoperative outcome, but the same is also true for the existing pulmonary vascular resistance in those patients and lessons we learned from IPAA patients, uh, IPAH patients, and this is a depiction of our IPAH patient cohort in Giessen shows that if we are unable to reduce the pulmonary vascular resistance be below certain levels, these patients will ultimately die from pulmonary hypertension. These are 10-year observational data, and it clearly shows if we are able to reduce the uh, pulmonary vascular resistance below 600 dynes, patients will dramatically have, have a dramatically better outcome than patients in whom the pulmonary vascular resistance remains up above 600 dynes. Whether the numbers will be the same for CTEPH patients is not very important. I think the principle is important that we should uh, aim to reduce pulmonary vascular resistance as potent as we can. And in fact, reality already today, although there's no single approved drug for the medical treatment of, uh, uh, of CTEPH, shows us that already many patients receive PAH-targeted therapies. Again, from this very elegant uh, uh, paper from the uh, CTEF registry, shows us that uh, approximately 40% of all patients receive PAH-targeted therapies, even those who are primarily considered to be operable. 30% of them are pre-treated with medications, with no good reason, I would say. And also experience from San Diego shows that you cannot pre-prime the patients by medical therapy to have a better outcome after surgery. Just send them for surgery if they are surgically eligible. They, you don't have to pre-treat them and pre-condition them. They will improve after surgery. But it is also fair to say that 54% uh, of the patients already in absence of uh, an approved therapy, receive off-label PAH medications, and this is also without a good reason because there is no true evidence that these uh, treatments work in these patients. 
And the uh, drugs that are taken are those that we are used to take for patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension, coming from three classes, prostacyclins, endothelin receptor antagonists, and sildenafil. And I would say, in the absence of a positive randomized controlled trial, it's fair to use them on a compassionate treatment basis, but only after the patient has been evaluated by an experienced PEA surgeon. So don't circumvent that major piece in the diagnostic algorithm. Send the patients to the surgeon, and only if the surgeon says, we cannot do the operation, consider an on an individual basis a medical therapy uh, with one of those drugs. But again, they are not supported by evidence because there is no single clinical trial so far showing superiority of medical therapy in patients with CTEPH. Although there is already a vasoconstrictive component in the disease, and I mentioned to you that this is not purely a mechanical obstruction of the vessels, we have a vasoconstrictive component and a vascular proliferative component in the remaining pulmonary arteries that are patent and perfused. And we showed very early in a mixed patient population of PAH and 13 out of 30 patients that had CTEPH that if you apply some of those available uh, vasodilators such as uh, inhaled prostacyclins or an oral PDE5 inhibitor, you can substantially reduce pulmonary vascular resistance. And of course, in this mixed bag, the patients with CTEF had a less pronounced vasodilatory capacity, but they had some vasodilatory capacity. And that was the rationale that uh, investigators around the world tried to investigate whether one of the lead compounds for the treatment of pulmonary arterial hypertension, bosentan, would also be helpful in patients with non-operable chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, the so-called benefit study, in which the primary endpoint was the change in six-minute walking distance, but also the pulmonary vascular resistance was measured as a potential measure of success. And the surprising finding was that while there was a certain reduction of the pulmonary vascular resistance with bosentan, the change in six-minute walking distance from pre-inclusion to the end of the study was two meters. So there was no change, and the study was considered to be negative, and therefore bosentan was not approved for the treatment of, pulmonary, of chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. So we may now close the chapter for medical th uh, treatments for, pulmonary, uh, for chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension if we don't have a good new answer to this disease, and that's why we uh, further investigated and uh, together with the help of uh, uh, Bayer found a potential new compound, which is a novel uh, class of drugs, a first uh, of a, a novel class of drugs, an SGC stimulator, so it's a stimulator of the soluble gonalate cyclase. The drug is called Riosiguat, and it uh, is able to directly stimulate the native form of the soluble guanylate cyclase, independent of endogenous nitric oxide, thereby increasing the intracellular levels of cyclic GMP and resulting in the desirable effects on the pulmonary vasculature in that it relaxes the vessels, reduces the, flow, the pressure, increases the flow, and also has uh, some uh, anti-remodeling capacities. So this drug was investigated in uh, patients with chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, uh, as well as in patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension. This is a very early investigation we did with the lead compound, Riosiguat, in patients, and this was again a mixture of PAH and CTEF patients who underwent right heart catheterization. We assessed pulmonary vascular resistance. We applied the gold standard for vasoreactivity testing and inhaled nitric oxide to these patients and also applied one milligram or 2.5 milligrams of Rio Siguat acutely in the cath lab. What we were able to see is that the group response to inhaled nitric oxide was quite moderate. So the, we know from IPAH that there are approximately five to 10% of so-called responders, which have a very favorable response to uh, the administration of acute vasodilators, and the large error bar may be indicative of the fact that in that entire group, maybe one patient was hidden who was a true responder with an almost normalization of pulmonary vascular resistance, the other ones being quite unresponsive to this inhaled vasodilator, and the same was true in the other group. In the same group, the administration of one milligram of uh, Rio Ciguat and 2.5 milligrams of Rio Ciguat reduced pulmonary vascular resistance by almost 35%. So this is a strong pulmonary vasodilator, and this is the proof of concept that this drug might do something in this disease. And that was then forwarded to the conduction of a long-term chronic dosing phase two study 
in which a mixed bag of patients suffering from PAH and CTEPH, there was even a slight uh, predominance of CTEPH patients in this trial, were investigated and received increasing dosages up to 2.5 milligrams TID of rioseguat. And what is shown here in the first uh, uh, 12 weeks of the study uh, is the average response of the patients by means of improvements of their six-minute walking distance. We were used to see some increments in PAH patients when they received vasoactive therapies. But as I showed you in the benefit trial, we were quite surprised that also CTEPH patients, with this drug at least, could improve their six-minute walking distance considerably. Uh, you have to subtract a placebo effect here because we didn't have a placebo as a control here. So don't take the numbers that you may see here to, for granted. And uh, we clearly have to be aware about the limitations of a non-placebo controlled open label study. But still, I think it's quite indicative what we found that also CTEF patients to the same magnitude improved their six-minute walking distance as patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension did. And this is, was quite a surprising finding. And I also have to mention that these patients were deemed inoperable prior to inclusion to the trial. But in fact, some of the CTEPH patients, I think three or four of them, after improving in, in the trial, were then reconsidered by the same surgeon. And while the preoperative uh, risk was assessed as being too high before inclusion into the trial, after the hemodynamics have particularly improved uh, with the administration of this drug, the same surgeon decided to do the surgery and was successfully done in four patients out of the group of these CTEPA patients. Most importantly, I think, we also saw a very good consistency of the effect over the following three years of treatment. And 50% of those patients at the end of three-year follow-up were still on monotherapy with Rioseguat. So this is a strong indication that there might be something worth further pursuing with this drug. And I'd also like to mention that we have now conducted two independent randomized phase three placebo-controlled trials with Rioseguat, both in PAH and in CTEPH, results of which will be presented in this conference on Tuesday afternoon for those of, who, of you who are interested to see whether the outcome of the placebo-controlled randomized trials are as beneficial as we anticipated from the phase two study are welcomed to join the, uh, the uh, session in, on Tuesday afternoon. However, I sneaked into the room. It seems to be too small for the interest that might be around, so maybe ACCP considers to provide us with a larger room for that presentation on Tuesday afternoon. So in summary, allow me to summarize that CTEPH is a mixed disease involving mechanical obstruction, vasoconstriction, and remodeling of the remaining perfused areas of the lung. For CTEPH, Surgery, by means of PEA, is the treatment of choice. However, this has to be conducted in experienced centers only. And Dr. Testme uh, also suggests some other centers than San Diego and in the U.S., if there are any. Um, personally, I would uh, send my patients, as I, if I was a U.S. physician, to, uh, to San Diego, of course. And in Germany, for instance, we only have two centers. In France, there is only one center. This only shows you how few... Uh, surgeons are able to conduct the surgery successfully and on a higher volume, and that's where we should send our patients for evaluation. For the non-operable patients, or those who have residual chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension after surgery, and this is also a sizable proportion, up to 30% of these patients after surgery either have residual or recurrent pulmonary hypertension, uh, PAH therapies have been considered but there is no approved drug yet for the treatment of the disease by medications. Uh, a randomized controlled trial has been conducted with uh, uh, the SGC stimulator Rioseguat, results of which will be presented during the late breaker session at this conference on Tuesday. Thanks for your attention for this part, and I think we proceed with the post-test questions and see what responses we get here. Victor, you want to uh, perform the test? Should I run through it? All right. So, uh, again, coming to the question, which of the following is an approved medical therapy at the time being for CTEPH? A, iloprost, a prostacycline derivative. B, bosentan, an endothelial receptor antagonist. C, sildenafil, a PDE5 inhibitor. D, rioseguat, an SGC stimulator. Or E, none of the above. Which of them is currently approved? <laughs> 
Excellent. This uh, also is quite exciting that you agree that there is no approved therapy uh, for the treatment of CTEF. I'm curious to see how it was before. And you're very well informed to see that uh, the vast majority of you already knew that there is no approved therapy for the tr medical tr uh, treatment of uh, um, CTEPH. Now proceeding to the next question. So what is it that is done during the surgery? Is the surgeon removing a one lobe, for instance, of the affected lung that includes the segments? Or does the surgeon remove the fresh clots from segmental and subsegmental pulmonary arteries? Or is it a true end arterectomy, including organized thrombi and membranous occlusions of segmental and subsegmental pulmonary arteries? Or is it the removal of plexiform lesions that we have? Or is it none of the above? that this is the, the part the surgeon should do and uh, this is a perfect answer and now let's see you knew that from before excellent excellent this is an expert audience and I can leave the stage with a quite good feeling and uh, hand over to the chair okay well congratulations on acing your test today I had, uh, have one question card, which uh, the question is, if a VQ scan shows a very small but single perfusion defect, would you consider starting anticoagulation or just referring to a specialized center? And that's an excellent question. And like most things, and when we do these questions, they, you know, they are focused very much on a single point. And in this case, you know, I, the, the answer to the question really very strongly depends on what the capabilities are at your center whether you believe the patient has an acute PE or not. I would say on average, and when I see that patient, what I would do if I had reason to suspect an acute PE is I would start anticoagulation and I would immediately as if I would for the acute PE and then I would follow them up at a later time to ensure the resolution. Um, if the patient has, doesn't have an acute presentation, depending on where I was, I would either proceed to uh, right heart cath and pulmonary angiography with anticoagulation to follow, or I would go with a CT scan to evaluate for an acute PE as, and then start anticoagulation. So it's actually quite a complicated question. I think you have to pay, take that question in the context of uh, of what the capabilities are at your center. I'm fortunate enough to have a very exp experienced radiologist who can do pulmonary angiography for me. Um, and you take the individual patient. If it's an acute presentation, you don't wait to start anticoagulation. You can start the anticoagulation and sort it out later. Now, uh, if any of you have additional questions, that was the only question card we got. Um, Feel free, uh, feel free to come up to the microphone. You can see two of them, one in the back, one up front, and we'd be happy to answer questions. Okay, well, very good. I will, uh, I will be up here, and I will wait until everybody's gone. If you have a question and you want to come up and ask me, uh, come right on up, and I'll do my very best. Thank you much.